thousands of mummies in the very heart of Europe. Monks, doctors, soldiers, and even men, dead, yet resisting death's inevitable decay in the catacombs of Italy's Catholic churches. Some so remarkable, it's almost impossible to tell if they are dead or merely Who made these mummies and why? Now, the churches are permitting scientists to study these remarkable relics. Explorer goes inside the scientific expedition into 400-year-old flesh to uncover the secrets behind the mummy masterpieces. At the extreme southern tip of Italy, the island of Sicily. Described as a paradise populated by demons, scorching summers, menacing volcanoes, violent crime. In Sicily, the demons are never far away. Within Sicily's churches, there's a dark secret. Lurking underground, hidden or forgotten behind trapdoors for centuries. Strange death rites never investigated until now. Scientist Dario Piombino Mascali and Albert Zink are descending into this realm of the dead. They've been drawn to explore a distinctively Sicilian phenomenon. Human mummies preserved for hundreds of years. Who are these people? Caught in a limbo between life and death. Was this some sort of punishment? They seem to be screaming from the grave. Yeah, still a tongue inside. Still got one eye. For the first time, the church has granted these scientists permission to investigate. But the task is enormous. In crypts and tombs across Sicily, there are thousands of mummies. Experts suspect the first to be mummified was this monk, Father Silvestro, who died in 1599. Countless followed, body after body. Over the centuries, mummification develops into an art. And just before the practice disappears, comes its ultimate achievement. A masterpiece. The Sicilian sleeping beauty, Rosalia Lombardo. When I first saw Rosalia, I was so curious about this exceptional preservation. She was stunning, she was beautiful, she was very sweet, and uh, no one could give me an explanation for this exceptional uh, embalming. How did this perfect mummy come to be? And why did a tradition of mummy making begin here in the first place? To find out, Dario and his team of mummy experts will have to descend through 400 years of Sicily's dead. And it's just in time. Wow. They must have been in an upright position, and now they're just collapsing. 
After years of neglect, many of Sicily's historic mummies faced the danger of the rot and decay they had avoided for so long. Perhaps studying them would give these mummies a chance to be considered and to be restored and to tell us their history. Like a detective building a case, Dario begins to collect clues. He was called Giovanni Battista Racuia. He was a priest here and he died in January 1873 at the age of 65. Many of the mummies are hundreds of years old. Yet somehow, they're remarkably well preserved. A body dead this long isn't supposed to exist. One second past death, the force preserving the body falters. Once the heart stops, the forces of decomposition are unleashed. Lactic acid builds in major muscle groups, stiffening them into rigor mortis. Cells break down. Enzymes are freed and become flesh eaters. Bacteria moves without restriction, devouring body tissues. On the outside, insects arrive to finish the job, reducing human flesh to dust in less than a year but not in Sicily. For some reason, ashes to ashes, dust to dust did not apply here. Among the first clues Dario uncovers, the earliest bodies to be preserved as mummies are all priests and monks. The discovery sends Dario to Sicily's archives. He finds reports claiming that in the late 1500s, monks were discovered in tombs miraculously intact. Even more significant are indications that mummification began as a custom operating behind closed doors among a little-known order of the Catholic Church, the Capuchins. They were a splinter group of Franciscan friars that believed in living in extreme austerity, wearing hooded robes or cappuccio, the mark of a hermit. They were the traditionalists of their day, and the feature of their devotion was an emphasis on venerating the dead. How a small group of monks in Sicily eventually became mummy makers is unclear. They left no written records, but perhaps it all stems from the Capuchin's missionary travel, a keen fervor to take the ministry to the common people, even to tribal groups in the New World. When the Capuchins went on missions, especially in Mesoamerica, the ethnic cultures there introduced them to the ways they processed dead bodies. Across the globe, civilizations preserved the dead to worship their ancestors. The Chinchorro in South America practiced mummification over 7,000 years ago. Later on, the Egyptians perfected the art. The Capuchins may have been receptive to mummification practices because they too revered the dead. Catholic ritual has long included sacred images of the dead. And there may have been another factor, the Bible itself. In the to John, it says, Nicodemus came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes which weighed about a hundred pounds. They took Jesus' body and in accordance with Jewish burial custom, bound it up in wrappings of cloth with perfumed oils. 
Perhaps the final anointing of Jesus was inspiration for the Capuchins to preserve their own brethren after death. Whatever the motives, the monks probably didn't start out with the technical means for mummification. Some experts believe it all began accidentally. First, there's Sicily's climate. The weather isn't always hot. Winters can be quite cool. But it is generally dry all year long. And then there are the conditions down in the burial crypts, excavated deep into the cool ground under churches, lined with moisture-absorbing stone, and ventilated to minimize temperature fluctuation. A dead monk, entombed within these places, would have been naturally subjected to just the right conditions. Three months to a year, and the result could be a mummy. In a church in the medieval town of Savoca, the scientists descend into a subterranean crypt in search of clues to how the Capuchins learned to arrest the body's natural decay. In addition to tombs full of mummies, they're finding elaborate preparation rooms with wall niches and racks built specifically for drying out cadavers. They were just put in here and sat like this and probably staying here for, I don't know, a couple of months. Yeah. And the liquid would drain into the hole, which is at my back. Yeah, and if the, if the fluid would stay in the body, the body would completely de yeah, decay. Yeah, decompose. Oh, Slowly. As Dario and Albert are discovering in the Savica tombs, not only were the monks preserved, but the Capuchins wanted these bodies displayed. He was the first one who was put in here, and the others came later. So, but it was something special to be put in here. He is the oldest identifiable mummy. He's called Giuseppe Nicotina, and he was an abbot. He died in 1795. His face is frozen in what appears to be a screen. That's only an effect of desiccation. It wasn't actually suffering. Some people think this is the last expression they had when they died, but it's just the effect of the desiccation. It does, has nothing to do with what happened in his last seconds of his life. But if their investigation into the mummies is to go any further, the scientists will need a closer view. Inside, the bodies themselves. In the tiny hilltop village of Piraino, Sicily, inside the town church, beneath the altar where mass is held every Sunday, is a crypt containing 26 mummies. They've been here for hundreds of years. Armed with 21st century technology, the latest in portable X-ray scanners, Dario and his team have arrived to examine the mummies, hoping there are clues still inside the bodies about how they lived and died, and how they were preserved. But before they can make their X-ray pictures, the team runs into a problem. 21st century science tripped up by 16th century architecture. The passageway leading to the crypt is extremely steep and narrow. The main issue here is that the X-ray machine is too big and too heavy to bring in the crypt. And at the same time, I'm very scared to bring the mummies upstairs because they're very fragile. They decide to try maneuvering the X-ray machine, over 260 pounds and extremely fragile itself, 
down the crypt's twisting stairs. Centimeter by centimeter, they squeeze it through, an accomplishment that will reduce the risk of damage to the mummies. Some of these brittle bodies haven't been moved in the hundreds of years since they were first interred in the 1700s. Buried in a grave, these antique robes, the very ones they wore in life, would have disintegrated, lost to the ages. These clothes were the clothes used for the celebration of the Mass. When the desiccation occurred, they were clothed this way. Because you never stop being a priest when you are a priest, even when you're dead. The clothes are remarkably preserved, and beneath them, so are flesh, tissue and bone. It's very yeah. stiff. They may even provide clues to how mummification itself was changing. Yeah. Since their historical value makes dissection out of the question, using an X-ray to do the examining is ideal. And soon the team is at work, scanning the mummies. The machine shoots a 200 millisecond burst of X-rays perfect for penetrating the bodies of the dead without damaging them. Okay. Yeah. okay, let's go outside. But these rays are harmful to the living, so the team retreats behind the thick walls of the crypt. Yeah, excellent. With the very first pictures, clues start emerging about who this mummy was, its health, sex, and age. It looks like he has a big degree of dental yeah. wear. It's very thin, so maybe he had uh, an abscess here at, this, at the root. Yeah, here we have some arthritis of the cervical spine. Within the mummy are the bones of an old man, someone who lived a surprisingly long life for the times, well into his 50s or longer. Radiologist Steffi Panzer spends most of the year X-raying living patients in a trauma center in southern Germany. Working on the bones of the dead isn't that different. In fact, they're finding that the quality of life for these mummies was unexpectedly high. Analysis of bone samples reveals the priests enjoyed a diet rich in seafood protein as well as grains. So rich, the x-rays show evidence of gout, diabetes, and obesity. Far different than the austere lifestyle of the Capuchins when Sicilian mummification began. It's evidence that preservation practices are changing. No longer a clandestine custom among a small sect of monks, now it's church leaders with affluent lifestyles that are the ones being mummified. He has a necklace. Look, see? A necklace suddenly stands out from the gray contours of rib and muscle. It might just be inside. That's it. It's like a rosary. Like an Egyptian mummy adorned with an amulet, many of these priests were dressed for the journey into the hereafter with the rosary beads they held so close in life. The mummy suggests that by the early 1800s, mummification in Sicily was expanding. Yet they don't appear to be preserved any differently than the older natural mummies the scientists have seen. They aren't helping the team understand how a mummy of the quality of Rosalia eventually emerged. But in a church in the nearby town of Savaka, the trail gets hot again. Among the 25 mummies they've discovered here, one is quite different. He wasn't a monk, nor was he a priest. He's dressed in the garments of a 19th century nobleman. And this mummy was no accident. I thought all the mummies were just natural mummified and just maybe with a little help from inside, but this was really like an autopsy. It was very surprising. 
What we have here is a case of embalming. This individual was subjected not only to a complete craniotomy and removal of the brain, but also to an incision starting from the neck and going down to the pelvic region. We can also see how the cavity was completely filled with vegetal material. By the 1700s, medical discoveries in Europe may have begun to influence mummification techniques in Sicily. Even the Egyptians knew that internal organs left in the gut can putrefy and spoil a mummy's preservation. Incisions directly to the abdomen would allow organs to be removed for washing and sealing with resins and spices. Now they're seeing mummies where the hand of the mummifier is much more pronounced and the quality more impressive. Clues to the deepest motives behind the mummification are turning up in other parts of Italy, in mummies believed to be miracles. And the mummifier, the hand of God. In churches throughout Italy, one can find collections of relics, bone, hair, fingernails, and fabric culled from the bodies of saints. Despite death, dismemberment, and dispersal, these odds and ends are considered holy. But when the body of an ancient saint is found entirely intact, it's considered a miraculous sign of the divine. Of all Italy's mummies, the most revered are a hundred or so known as the incorruptibles. Nearly 600 years after her death, the corpse of St. Catherine of Bologna somehow resists decay. It's drawing the probing eye of pathologist and investigator for the Vatican, Ezio Fulcheri. He's using science to judge cases of miracle mummification across Italy. We found that the bodies of some saints have been artificially mummified. The church is not opposed to this time, because they seek the truth. The challenge is stay firmly anchored to scientific principles. Fulcheri and his team are in the midst of a couple of cases, examining some of the church's most sacred mummies. This is the body of the blessed Giovanni Guerulli, a priest born eight centuries ago, but whose corpse is remarkably intact. Fulcheri wants to know if the preservation is miraculous or was helped along on its way by human hands. Of course, undertaking a full forensic exam on the body of a saint is no simple checkup. It begins by breaking church seals that have secured the body for hundreds of years. Each study is always a new experience because it is like having a dialogue with a saint. It is their actual presence. It is the actual testimony of their life which is revealed to us after many centuries. On a number of fact-finding investigations, Fulcheri has unwrapped a so-called incorruptible, only to see direct human intervention in the form of deep incisions, rough stitching, and a body packed with stuffing. Hello? Today, Fulcheri is resorting to high-tech imaging tools to peer inside the body of the Guerulli mummy. The body? Uh... While the body's exterior shows no signs of tampering, perhaps the evidence lies within, just waiting for a trained eye. In fact, what they see is a shock. The mummy's bones are riddled with fractures. How many fractures? Oh, I think they are a lot. I, I, I didn't count all the refractures. 
you see there are multiple displays that you can see femur fractures. None of the fractures bear the telltale marks of healing. So these breaks must have occurred after death. But they don't suggest artificial preservation by themselves. For that, Fulcheri is looking for signs of direct cuts to the bone. The investigation moves to the brain case. In fact, for a moment, it looks like there is no brain. Was it removed through the nose like an Egyptian mummy? Then they see it. After eight centuries, it's dried and shriveled at the bottom of the skull. There are no signs that it has been opened or drilled. No sign of any skull operation. In fact, even after months of close examination, no signs of human intervention are found. I did not find incisions, cuts, or substances that could have been used for mummification. So I can say without a doubt that it is a natural mummy. A miracle? Perhaps. Yet we already know from the mummies discovered in Sicily, natural mummification occurs. Whether we can explain it or not, the fascination we feel is inescapable, especially when something as frail as human flesh becomes so surprisingly impervious. Back in Sicily, Dario and Albert are discovering that as the years went on, the question of who was getting mummified would change yet again. Ordinary Sicilians wanted their loved ones to be preserved and to have a chance at mummified immortality. Clues to that distinctively Sicilian aspiration can sometimes be found right out on its streets. Normally the dark dominion of Sicily's mummified dead stays hidden underground except for one night each year. Every July 14th, Sicilians in Palermo turn out by the thousands to affirm the power of the everlasting dead in the lives of the living. For 400 years, Santa Rosalia, the patron saint of Palermo, has been worshiped. As the legend goes, the remains of her corpse miraculously saved the city from a terrible plague. The devotion continues, lavished over a gilded box holding the few bones left of her body. That is part of the Sicilian culture. There is a strong relationship between the living and the dead and this is celebrated during the year. For the faithful in Sicily, Death is by no means an end. Deep below the streets of Palermo is a crypt like no other. The scientists' investigation has brought them to Sicily's grandest of catacombs and a crucial leap forward in the art of mummification. This is absolutely amazing. It's incredible how just beneath the heart of Palermo, there is another city, which is the city of the dead, where they are here for us to tell us about their history, their lives, the way they died. It's absolutely fascinating. For someone who studies mummies, this is really the place where you have to be. The numbers of mummies are staggering. About 2,000 assembled into a bizarre necropolis. Its very existence may have been an unintended side effect of the Capuchin's devotion. As an act of humility, Capuchins forbade themselves from burial inside the church. Instead, they dug this subterranean tomb nearby, and once again, the atmospheric conditions in the crypt began desiccating and preserving the bodies of the monks. 
By the 1800s, the upper classes wanted their dead preserved as well. Entire corridors were built for men and women, priests, professors, lawyers, and soldiers. There was even a special section devoted to children. The ranks of the mummified now included everyday Sicilians, dressed in their living best. And their embalming was increasingly scientific as well. The team has turned their attention to another mummy. Must be something from the embalming fluid. X-rays reveal that his embalmers had taken a huge step forward, using the body's artery system for their craft. Look, but there's something in the artery, something artificial, which you wouldn't really find there. Yeah. It was injected through the neck, but you can still see... Traces of embalming fluid, perhaps arsenic or mercury, remain crystallized. In the 1800s, mummifiers began using the body's circulatory system. An injection into the carotid artery in the neck allowed embalming fluid to permeate all the way to the cells. With the advent of early modern surgical expertise, the quality of the mummies improves again. The skin is softer the body less gaunt. Even facial and scalp hair is retained. As much as we've seen Sicilian mummy making advance, from special drawing rooms used by the monks to bodily incisions and injections by early surgeons, the art would go even further to the work of a mysterious chemist at the start of the 20th century. The Sicilian Sleeping Beauty, two-year-old Rosalia Lombardo. She is a case apart, lying flawlessly preserved in her glass-topped coffin for the past 80-some years. Rosalia Lombardo Rosalia Lombardo represents a special mystery in what we might call this garden of death. She's a child, and childhood is an unusual time to die. But she's also a child who looks like a doll or an angel. She's one of the best preserved mummies that I've ever seen. Now understand, we can only see certain parts of her body. If the rest of her body is preserved as well as uh, the parts that we can see, it's probably one of the most perfect effects of embalming that we've ever had the chance to see. So perfect is this mummy, some have wondered if her corpse was substituted long ago with a lifelike doll. One, two, three. Ugh. The mystery compels the scientists to fill in the answers that for so long have gone missing. Yet nothing prepares them for their first close-up view, especially Rosalia's eyes so unlike all the wide-eyed mummies in the crypts. And I think when the lids are a little bit open like this, it, it just gives you an impression that there's an eye. Yeah. To give the impression that she's only sleeping. Yeah. She looks great, though. I, I just love her. She's my favorite mummy ever. <laughs> I know this. But is there a real child beneath the glass? If they're going to find out, they'll have to try to make x-rays right through the coffin. After 80 years in a sealed box, they can't risk exposing her to the air in the catacombs. Are we ready? The images that result may also shed light on the shadowy figure behind Rosalia's everlasting corpse. Dario learns that shortly after her death from pneumonia in 1920, a Sicilian chemist, Alfredo Salafia, mummified Rosalia. He began his experiments on animals, but by the early 1900s, Salafia was embalming Italian heads of state and important religious figures. Even members of his own family. 
Does this name remind you of something? Salafia. Yay! Oh. It's Ernesto Salafia, the brother of Professor Alfredo ah, Salafia. It's his brother. Yeah, right it's here. him. His reputation as an embalmer would soon extend far beyond Sicily. In 1910, Salafia traveled to America and found an audience eager for his expertise. Newspaper notices document Salafia performing demonstrations for prominent doctors and undertakers. He was basically one of the first ones who made embalming more scientific. Americans already had a 60-year history with chemical embalming, advanced by the Civil War. Efforts that relied on toxic heavy metal preservatives like arsenic. Salafia soon began selling his own embalming fluid. But what it contained has become a famous mystery ever since Salafia died in 1933. And his formula disappeared. After returning to Palermo, his remaining achievement was the mummification of Rosalia Lombardo. When Rosalia died, the family was desperate and they would do anything to preserve her body. This is why they called Professor Salafia, who was the most famous embalmer of Palermo, and who would accept to preserve Rosalia in the best possible way. Now, nearly a century later, scientists are set to X-ray Rosalia and clear up years of rumor and legend. Oh. oh my god, there's nothing to see. The mummy refuses to reveal her secrets. The coffin appears to be lined with lead. Yeah, it's because of the lead inside. Yeah. Salafia's work didn't stop with the body. He specified the coffin design down to exacting detail. Rosalia's casket is topped with two layers of glass and sealed with wax to block moisture. Within the wood box, her head rests on a wooden platform, tipped at a slight angle, and the entire coffin is lined with lead foil. If the lead foil is too thick, they may have no chance to know if this sleeping beauty is a fake or not. We can try it again with more, with more power. Maybe, maybe we get something, let's hope. They boost the intensity of the X-ray beams. Look. And then they have their answer. Oh, it's much better. Oh, much better. Look at oh this. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What's that? I can't believe it. It's a lump. still preserved. Yes. And you see here the right and the left arm. And the skull. And it's also the brain is preserved. Oh, my God. It's completely preserved. Oh, All her organs. Her brain and tissues are intact. She is real. I know Salafia will disappoint me. I'm not sure. <laughs> Her preservation, all Salafia's formula. To discover Salafia's secrets, Dario returns to the archives. I wanted to find actual documents on this, on the whole story. I think that was the right thing to do for both Salafia and Rosalia. So I, I just had the feeling I had to, to solve this. Now there's been a breakthrough, one that will finally reveal Salafia's fabled formula. And a one-of-a-kind opportunity to see his groundbreaking method put into practice. The investigation into Sicily's 400-year history of mummification has led to this door. Hello. Hello. Ciao. Salve. In searching for the final piece of the puzzle explaining the Rosalia mummy, the scientists have finally located a distant relative of Salafia, 
Rosalia's mysterious embalmer, a great niece of Salafia's second wife. Anna Filippone has a trove of family papers. And among them, a diary written by Salafia in his own hand and filled with photographs from his career. It's an extraordinary chance to hear Salafia himself speaking from beyond the grave. The Egyptians tried, the Capuchins tried, but none achieved the ideal. That is, to preserve the cadaver such as it rests at the moment of death. I was able to achieve this. And the long lost formula is here. The formula was basically made of formalin, zinc sulfur, alcohol, and glycerin. Surprisingly, it doesn't contain arsenic or mercury, toxic chemicals so prevalent in 19th century embalming. But to understand how Salafia's formula produced the perfect mummy, Dario will need to make one last journey. In the U.S., at an anatomical research facility near Chicago, Dario will have an unusual opportunity to put Salafia's method to the test. Salafia came here about a hundred years ago, and now I'm coming here with this lost formula. And uh, it's so exciting because uh, we can do exactly the same things he was doing. We can experiment. It's great. Dario and a team of mummy experts and embalmers are making an unprecedented attempt to analyze the Salafia method in the midst of an actual embalming. The first step is mixing chemicals. You got everything ready? Uh, glycerin, formalin. These chemicals may not surprise morticians working today, but in 1900, using formaldehyde was a game-changing event compared to poisonous preservatives like arsenic and mercury, Salafia's ingredients were safer, cheaper, and more effective. Now they are ready to try it. This cadaver has been kept in cold storage for close to two weeks. So restoring it to a lifelike appearance will be an embalming challenge. A machine is used to pump fluids under pressure into the body's vascular system of arteries and veins. How long does it take to inject the body? It could be 20 minutes, 25 minutes. It all depends on what you're, how fast you are injecting the body. This is the moment all the Sicilian embalmers faced from the early Capuchins all the way to Alfredo Salafia. They wanted to put the forces of death on hold, preserving a lifelike appearance. The team is looking for signs the recipe is working. Well, it looks like we may be seeing a little bit over here. And you can see even the change in the color of the, the fingertips and the coloration that you're getting. They're starting to get some changes in the skin texture. If you notice, it's firming up a little bit. It's working. <laughs> you that. can see the changes in the yes. color. There's actually changes in the nails. And if you notice on the other side, they've pretty much cleared up of that dark purple stain that was there. And you can see all in through here, the coloration that we're getting. It took less than 20 minutes and three gallons of embalming fluid to transform a cadaver into a loved one for a family to see. My role is to give them a sense of peace through this last opportunity they have to see their loved one. And I think that's really what he, he achieved it. We know that he achieved it. We have the proof that he achieved that. And I think that that's really the, the best work that we could ever hope to have within our embalming careers. The 
The embalming of Rosalia Lombardo would mark the high point and nearly the end of mummy making in Sicily. Eventually the practice ceased and the Capuchins no longer accepted the dead for display. Today, a handful of monks cloistered above the crypts continue to maintain the catacombs and their historic residence. At first it seemed so eerie and strange. But maybe it isn't so hard to understand after all, the wish to cheat death. 